Hey, it's me, Destin. Welcome to the second channel here. This is an interview with Dr. Tony Case, an astrophysicist from the Smithsonian Astrophysical Observatory. The man is brilliant, and I, I really appreciate the time because he was tired. He had been interviewing all day, but he took the time to educate me on the Faraday Cup for the Parker Solar Probe. This is extremely interesting. Check it out. I'm Dustin. Tony. Hey, Tony. Case. And, and who are you with? I'm with the Smithsonian Astrophysical Observatory. So we're part of the Smithsonian, um, which is a lot of museums and a lot of research centers. And the Smithsonian Astrophysical Observatory is uh, affiliated with Harvard, uh, up at the Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics in Cambridge, Mass. And so this is the instrument that's poking out from behind the thermal protection system. This is it. So this is uh, a qualification model. We used it to uh, test before we built the actual version that's on the spacecraft. So it's a one-to-one um, -one copy. This is a one-to-one -one copy, exact size, exact same materials and everything. Oh. Where are you based out of? Uh, Huntsville. Oh, okay, Huntsville, cool. yeah. So we did a lot of testing at Marshall. Did you? Yeah, with this instrument. Yeah, like shake and bake? What'd you do? Uh, we did, so we did um, most of our performance testing down at Marshall Space Flight Center. So they have a place called the Solar Wind Facility. And- uh, We have that at, uh, at, in Huntsville? Yeah, so in, at Marshall Space Flight Center. Um, there's a vacuum chamber. We can put it under vacuum. And then there's essentially a simulation of the solar wind. So they've got an ion gun, an electron gun, and we can set them up so that they're shooting right into our instrument and we can measure essentially the same thing as we'll be measuring in space and make sure it works. That's awesome. Do you do it under a solar load? Like So we did testing in two different ways on this instrument. Usually with NASA, you want to test as you fly. And so you want to recreate the exact conditions that you have in space on Earth and demonstrate that it completely works before you put it onto the spacecraft. In this case, it's not actually possible because we have 500 times the amount of sunlight that we have here on Earth. So we did testing where we put this into a chamber and we illuminated it with a ton of light and it got super hot and we showed that it didn't break. And then we did separate testing where we put this into a chamber without the light and we performance tested it so we could see that it was making the measurements we wanted to make. Um, and we only did just a little bit of testing where it was under this huge light load and making the measurements at the same time just to demonstrate that we could do it. But for the most part, we had to separate those two functions out. So what's the mesh right here? So that's a tungsten, a fine tungsten grid, 90% transparent, and the particles flow through that. And it's tungsten because it has the highest melting point. Yep, and it's the hottest portion of the instrument, right at the center of that grid gets up to a 3,000 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, and then behind the grid you can see in the front is another grid that we put at 6,000 volts. That creates an electric field. The charged particles then get reflected out because of that electric field, or they make it through if they have a high enough speed. And then you're detecting those? And then we detect them. In the very back, there's uh, a piece of metal uh, that you won't be able to see here, but these four wires connect to that piece of metal. And so as the charged particles impact the metal, they deposit their charge, and we measure that as a current that's coming out uh, through those wires. So, so on these wires right here? Yeah, so this is high voltage going up that drives the high voltage grid, and then the wires inside here are carrying the signal coming back. So out. you're driving the high voltage grid to guide what's coming in. Yep. We can select the speed of particles that we want to measure by putting a certain voltage on the grid. So is your wire made out of copper? It's made out of niobium. What? Niobium. <laughs> yeah, copper would melt. It's way too hot for copper. Okay. Um, so it's made out of niobium. So how do you insulate something like that? So it's insulated by uh, little sapphire beads. So it's niobium on the outside here and then sapphire beads. What? And then the niobium wire runs through each of those little bits of sapphire and through these little corners where there's little elbows made of sapphire. And um, in that way, the center conductor is insulated from the outer conductor. So this is like... So basically you got a bunch of unobtainium and fantastaloid and you put them together and made a, a CRT tube that's way more fancy than that. Yeah, no, I mean, think of it as a, like a vacuum tube. That's basically what it is. Um, and it operates in vacuum, so you don't have to enclose it in glass. Uh, and so that's pretty much what it is. And you can select the speed of particles that are coming in with a voltage and, and then and regulate the current that you end up with on your collector plate. So and the ultimate goal of this device, which is one of the main main pieces of science on the spacecraft is to count neutrinos. What? Is that the word? Nope. <laughs> <laughs> I'm an idiot. I am a mechanical engineer. I understand wrenches. All right, so, uh, <laughs> so this is, think of it as like what the sun is made of. Okay, there are a lot of neutrinos coming from the sun, but um, it's made of mostly hydrogen and helium. Okay. The bulk constituents of the universe and of the sun. 
Uh, and so the, the hydrogen comes out as ionized hydrogen or just protons. And the helium comes out as typically doubly ionized helium. So typically it would have two electrons. Both of those are stripped off. We call those alpha particles if you're talking about radiation. Um, and those are the two main constituents of the solar wind along with electrons. And we measure all of those. So you're measuring flux. Yes. So you're measuring like as you get closer and closer to the sun, you're going to be able to understand the density of solar wind, uh, not coronal mass ejections, because I'm assuming that would kill you if that happened. Nope. We'll, we'll measure those. Bull. Yep. So bull, you're not going to be able to, you're going to take a coronal mass ejection to the face. Right to the face. <laughs> There's no it's, way. So, really? Yeah. Oh, so the, so the, the cool thing about coronal mass ejections is it's basically the same plasma that is there all the time. It's just ejected in slightly more dense form and faster. What are you talking about? I can see it. What are you, you saying slightly you can see more? the solar wind too. Okay. In a coronal mass ejection. So th let's let's make sure we understand the difference between a flare and a coronal mass ejection. First of all, I don't. Okay. And I would love for you to tell me. All right, here we go. So a f the flare is what we see in light. So if you look at the solar surface, and especially if you look at it with an X-ray telescope, then when one of these large releases of energy happens, uh, there are particles that f like get accelerated and flow back down toward the surface and end up emitting, emitting a lot of light. A lot of that's in x-rays and we measure it and it's just this huge increase in the flux of light that we see. In addition to that, there is all this plasma around the sun in the corona uh, and near the surface of the sun. And that plasma, at the same time that flare is happening, gets accelerated and flows away from the sun. So that part, the particle part, is what we call the coronal mass ejection. The light part is what we call a flare. They tend to happen about the same time. And which one is solar wind? And the solar wind is essentially the same thing as the coronal mass ejection, but it's like the steady state happening all the time portion of that. It's like constant pressure. Yes, it's just constantly flowing out all the time. And the reason, and if you go back to Gene Parker's description of why this is happening, is essentially the sun is a lot of hot gas, and that's at high pressure. And then you get a way, way, way away from the sun. And what do you have? The vacuum of space. There's hardly any particles out there. So you can almost think of this as like a vacuum cleaner. There's such a pre pressure differential, and the thing at the center is so hot that there's really no other option, physics-wise, besides these particles flowing outward to sort of fill the void. Oh, I'm starting to think about mathy things. So, so <laughs> is the art of the fourth, uh, are you predicting, you're predicting, obviously, with a model of some sort, and R to the fourth value decrease as you go out from the sun? The density falls off as one over R squared. Oh, it really? Yeah. What am I thinking? Uh, Something wrong, obviously. Maybe flux. I don't know. So one over R squared. Uh, yeah, one over R squared. So when we go into, and it's that's the same as the light falling off. And the reason, the way you get that one over R squared is if you picture something that's a sphere and then thing, think about either the light or the particles flowing radially away from that sphere, then you're basically flowing these particles into an area of R squared. And so that's basically how both of those things work. And so the light, when we get close to the sun, will be 500 times brighter. The density that we're trying to measure is also gonna be 500 times higher than what we measure here at Earth, which is why this is so small compared to other Faraday cups that we've built that were this big, because we have a huge density to work with. I see. So you're trying to, yeah, I got it. So you're trying to take a, a smaller sample over a, no, the same sample over a smaller surface area because you have more total energy coming in. Yep. And you don't want to just cook everything. Or, I mean, you're going to have solar pressure to deal with that will actually turn the spacecraft. There is, yeah. So that is something we have to worry about. Um, they have to make sure that the center of pressure of the spacecraft, that is, when the light hits it, it exerts a force. And because it's 500 times brighter than here, it's actually a measurable force. Uh, and if the center of gravity is not right behind the center of pressure, then it tilts the spacecraft. It's a torque. This is one of the things that's causing a torque because we stick out only on one side of the spacecraft. So, so the GNC people hate you. <laughs> <laughs> They've learned to live with us. <laughs> okay. So uh, next question, maybe last question. What's the data going to look like? I mean, we're, we're not going to see pictures of the sun coming out off of the spacecraft. Right. So yet. there is one instrument on the spacecraft that takes pictures. But uh, what it takes pictures of is the solar wind. So just what we're measuring. And what, what happens is as the solar wind is flowing away from the sun, uh, light also comes off the sun and then it reflects off of the solar wind and comes back to the camera. And the camera can take a picture of that. So it's basically you've got the sun and you're gonna 
have a circle that blots it out right in the middle and you're gonna see... It turns out the circle that we use is just the heat shield. So the camera sits behind the heat shield, that blocks the sun, and then the camera looks out at the dim light that's bouncing off of the solar wind. So alignment matters. But aren't you gonna Definitely. see a tab? Aren't you gonna see that on one side of the heat shield? It's on the other side of the spacecraft. So the, the camera basically looks out in front of the spacecraft, like the direction that the spacecraft is heading. Got it. The idea being that it images the solar wind, and then the spacecraft, some number of hours later, flies through that same solar wind. So you get a global picture of what it looks like from the image, and then we get a, a measurement actually inside the solar wind once the spacecraft gets there from okay. this instrument. So once you, let's say we complete the mission, you do how many passes, 24 passes yep. on the sun? So you're going to have an idea of one particular elliptical arc as it approaches on that orbit. Yep. So how, how are you picking the arcs? Because you're trying to get a, an overall picture of the sun, uh, you know, hemispherically, or what's the word? You know, I mean, uh, the, enti the entire 3D structure of the sun is really important if you want to model what the output of the sun is going to be in terms of the solar wind or coronal mass ejections or flares and all of that. You have to really have a picture of the entire surface of the sun. What are you going to do with that data? Are we going to be able to orient future interstellar spacecraft off this? So, what are you thinking? So the basic idea is to like learn more about the physics of how the solar wind is being accelerated at the surface of the sun. Uh, or in the corona of the sun, I should say. Um, what we do right now is we try and predict what the solar wind is going to be when it gets to Earth. We want to do that because it affects things like, um, so we have geomagnetic storms that can cause like radio blackouts, they can cause problems with GPS, they can cause aurora, which is maybe a nice thing, um, and they can cause radiation damage to spacecraft. All of these things would, that we call space weather. Um, we want to be able to predict when those things are going to happen people like airlines and power industry, um, all those people care a lot. So if we, if we learn about the physics of how the solar wind is actually accelerated and heated near the sun, then we will much better be able to predict what it's gonna be like when it gets to Earth. And that's, that's sort of the practical purpose. The scientific purpose is the sun is a star. There are countless stars. <laughs> throughout the universe, and we want to know how those stars work. This is the only star that we can go up to, take a cup like this, stick it into the solar wind that's coming off of the star, and figure out precisely the physics processes that are going on near that star, and then we can use that to understand how all the other stars work. So when I was a kid, I had never flown in an airplane, and I asked my dad if I could go in an airplane with him one day, and we could get a little piece of cloud in a bottle. So you're saying we're doing that with the sun. Absolutely. We yeah. don't get to bring it back. We just have to send back radio signals that tell us what it's like. But that's essentially what we're doing. We're capturing a little bit of the corona in our instrument and figuring out what it is. And that data doesn't come through this wire. It comes through these wires. It comes through those three little wires. It goes to electronics that, if you looked at it, looked just like a computer board or something. Preamplifiers because it's a small signal. So we amplify the signal. We digitize it. We send it back down to Earth and it tells us all about what the solar wind is made of. Got it. That's awesome. What about Parker? Are you bros with Parker? I've met Parker. Um, he's a great guy. He's a member of one of the science teams, so he comes to our meetings sometimes. Um, and he's come and lectured at like my university was when I was in grad school. Um, and you know, we learn about like the Parker spiral and like all of these things that are like named after him and discovered by him. And, uh, and so it's a real honor to have the spacecraft named after him. And I mean, for me, it couldn't be named after anybody else. This is just, you know, it's, it stems from his thinking so many years ago. And it really is just like a continuation of, of all the science that he's done. That's awesome. Okay, I hope you enjoyed that interview. There are two other ones here on the second channel you should check out. Number one is Dr. Angela Alinto. She's the Dean of Physical Sciences at the University of Chicago, a peer of Dr. Eugene Parker's. You should go listen to her interview. She is fascinating. Also, Felipe from John Hop Johns Hopkins University Applied Physics Lab. He's the Deputy Lead Mechanical Engineer for the Parker Solar Probe. Talks a lot about integration of all this stuff and how it works. It's really fascinating. So check those out. Also, feel free to subscribe to this channel if you're interested in and checking out the behind the scenes stuff. Thanks for watching. I'm Destin. You're getting smarter every day. Have a good one. Bye.